This is the PR Podcast, a show about how public relations helps you tell your story to the world. We talk with great PR practitioners who have the skills, creativity, and just plain savvy to get their clients noticed. Now here's your host, Jody Fisher. Hey, everyone, and welcome to the PR Podcast. I'm Jody Fisher. Thanks for joining us. Well, happy Thanksgiving week. We hope you have some good plans that are set up in store for this week, whether you're getting together with family or friend, family and friends, or you're to celebrate, or you're still doing things at a distance this year, and I think some people might be, and I'm okay with that. That's great. We hope you stay safe and happy and healthy and do what's right for you. That's the most important thing. Um, because we want, if you can't do it this year, then we want you to be able to do it next time. We want to get back to normal, as normal as we possibly can in the future. Uh, we also hope your year is closing out well. You know, I've been on the, the new client proposal hamster wheel, as I said to a friend of mine, for the last month or so. And it's an indication to me that smart businesses are getting ready for 2022. Uh, so I hope things are trending in the right direction for you. I hope you're setting up your, your new year right with lots of new clients. Hope you, the old clients are coming with you for another year. Hope you're signing those contracts and, uh, and getting those projects off on the right foot. Um, I have seen bump up across the board, by the way, higher education, real estate, finance, especially interested in PR services. Those are kind of the verticals that I service. Um, so I'm interested to hear what you're seeing. Are you seeing bump in your uh, verticals in your areas that you are a specialist in. Chime in on our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and let us know. We always like to take the temperature of our colleagues and of the industry to see how things are trending and to share those best practices and that inside information. Now let's get on to the business at hand. We have a terrific guest this week. Let's get right into it. Dr. Amanda Holdsworth has spent her career working in public and private higher education, public school districts, career technical education centers, and private schools. She is passionate about telling their stories, their challenges, their successes, their breakthroughs in ways that invoke a sense of pride amongst their communities while appealing to their target audiences. She has also consulted for a wide variety of nonprofit and government organizations along the way. She and I both have higher education PR in our blood, so this should be a fun conversation. Amanda, welcome to the PR podcast. Well, thanks so much for having me, Jody. I'm excited to be here with you. Uh, tell us a little bit about your business and what you do with your clients. Sure, well, Holdsworth Communications was really born out of the fact when I spent about 17 years working in both higher ed and K through 12, as you had mentioned, and just seeing the need for someone in this space um, that really truly understood what it was like behind the scenes of an educational institution, whether that was as my time as a full-time professor or as an executive director of communications and marketing at a small private university or director of communications at a large public research university or communications director of private school and public school districts, I've kind of seen it all. And um, you know, what's my kind of personality and seeing that I wanted to do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, having my own consultancy really made sense. So what we do is Holdsworth Communications, we're really focusing in the education sector and, and we're rooted in strategy and research. I did my doctorate in research or my doctorate in education several years ago, just so I could have more of a foundation of research and almost like street credibility. As you know, in education, they, they, they love having other educators in that space. So um, it's really helped me a lot because I can do not just the market research and analysis, but really do a deep dive with audiences that not only help tell the stories that we need for PR, but really set uh, their root and their foundation um, for the strategy going forward. I wonder, the last 18 months in the context of COVID and what we've been going through um, have dealt a lot of really challenging, challenging challenges. Wow, there's the writer at work. But uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, enormous challenges to the education industry, whether that's K through 12, higher ed, uh, and, and some distinct differences between the two. Let's start maybe at 30,000 feet, if we can, and then sort of dig down into the two separate, because I think they are distinctly separate um, areas. Um, what have been some of the, maybe the universal challenges to uh, to education and education um, communicators uh, over the last 18 months? Well, I think the biggest challenge for education communicators is that they were already doing a lot to begin with. They were already working well beyond their job descriptions. Uh, I can say that, uh, you know, even going back in my career, 15, 20 years, you're always doing more. And especially if you're a good communicator, you're rewarded with more on your plate. 
And so when they were already doing more to begin with, then you're going to throw a pandemic in the mix where nobody knows what's happening. So you have communicators now sitting on every committee. If they're you know, thought of in a great leadership way as they should be, they're sitting on every committee. They're understanding what's going to be happening, what's happening on a pipeline with the health organizations, what's happening in their states or their countries or provinces or wherever they are. So they're not only just doing their job, they're also having to look at how do we forecast this for communication. So it's putting out fires times about 100 because not only are they trying to get ahead of what's happening and to be able to give the best advice to their leadership, but also um, their, the most clear communication to their audiences, they're also still trying to do their job of telling the great stories that are happening within their schools and university, while also attracting new students. But it's hard to promote those programs when you know school might not be in session, so they've got to think around strategy. So that has been the biggest challenge, that they were already stretched to the max, and then the pandemic is just putting – 100, 1,000 times more work on it. And then throw that into the mix with contentious um, audiences and people that are thinking that no matter what you do is the wrong way to do it. Um, it's, it's kind of a recipe for disaster in some situations. And, and I've seen, unfortunately, 15 now of the top school PR people at all levels leave the profession completely just since um, last fall. And that just breaks my heart because these were people who were incredibly committed to their schools and universities, just doing phenomenal work, phenomenal workers, phenomenal people making such a change and impact by sharing the wonderful stories of successes and to see them just say, you know what, I'm done. I, I'm going to go corporate or I'm going to go in this other organization or I'm just going to take a break period because I'm so burnt out and I'm just done. Um, it's, it's very disheartening. Yeah, for sure. The last 18 months has produced an awful lot of burnout uh, across a lot of industries um, and, and education definitely being one of them. Um, you know, my, my impression of sort of the way things went in the last 18 months with, with education communications is, you know, we kind of had that, that crisis moment in the beginning where everything broke, everything shut down. And it was just, uh, okay, let's, let's sort of take a step back, huddle, figure out what we're going to do. And it was almost like a following the science kind of thing of saying one foot in front of the other. Okay, now we can do this. Okay, now we can do that. Um, but also doing that under the pressure of having to pivot very, very quickly. I know uh, as a parent, you know, we were all about, okay, what's going to happen on Monday? Fine. We're, we're, you know, we're not going to school for a couple of days. What's happening on Monday and where are the Chromebooks and how are the kids going to get their lessons and all that other kind of stuff. And my higher education clients were faced with the same kinds of challenges. How did you help your clients through that initial period, that first maybe week or two, if you can look back? Well, you know, appreciating key messages at the very beginning of the pandemic, I just kept saying, if you don't tell your story, somebody else will, and you're probably not going to like the narrative. And I told that over and over and over again. I said, you know, if you don't know the answer, that's okay. Parents or, you know, in the case of uh, students and, or in higher ed, you know, you're talking about adult students. They just want to know that you're working on it and you're trying to figure it out. Now, you can't keep saying, you know, for months that we don't know. But if, if you're looking at a situation saying, listen, this is what we're doing, we're working the local you know, health department, we're hoping to make a decision by tomorrow, um, if we can't give us some wiggle room, that people at least will develop some kind of trust and faith that as school leaders, you're doing something to help kind of rectify the situation that you're all in it together. So that was, that was one component. And the other component with that storytelling, I was encouraging schools, um, you know, I said, you know, if you're open to this, and your teachers are open to it, have one of your teachers snap, you know, snap a picture you know, of, of them sitting around their own kitchen table with their three kids who are all trying to virtual learn while the teacher is sitting there. I said, I'm gonna tell you, and I, every single one of my clients who did this that was willing to do that, the, the complaints shut down so quickly because people realized, you know what? These, these teachers actually have lives too. And not only are they trying to teach my kid, they're trying to help their three kids or their one child or their baby get through a whole day being at home too. And so it kind of helped, um, I think, you know, visually tell a story that sometimes we not always have the words for. Uh, I, I specifically remember Jody, and I don't remember which school or which publication was in, but I remember maybe like around May of, or no, it was maybe uh, September. It was, it was early on in the pan pandemic. And it was a picture of a teacher in a dark classroom, sitting in the middle of the classroom with her head in her hands, with the kids up on the screen, all of her students up on the screen, like in Brady Bunch style. 
And I just thought that 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 was such a wonderful example of, you know what, this teacher did not choose this path. And you're right, like I'm, I'm a parent and I work in education day in and day out. I have that's all my, that my clients are in education and it's hard not to get frustrated, right? Like it's hard not to be like, oh, I'm so done with this remote learning. Like what's going on? Like my district only just got buses a couple of weeks ago because of the bus driver shortage. But I think when you're willing to open yourself up to vulnerability a little bit and show those stories, if you don't have the words, we do have social media, we do have newspaper contacts, we do have our own website and blog and e-newsletter, and not just, you know, with the negative news all the time, but just also as a subtle reminder of, you know what, we, we're, we're experiencing this in ways that we never thought we experienced. You know, as I tell people, teachers did not go into the profession to become rich and famous. They, they came to teach and they came to be with students. I'm pretty certain most of the teachers wouldn't have chosen to have taught the way that they've had to teach over the last year and a half. So just being open and honest and sharing those stories. And if you don't know, just don't ignore parents. Don't go for a week or two weeks without anybody hearing from them because that's just getting the rumor mills going. And, And once those rumor mills get going, it's really hard to stop them. Boy, you and I must have had the same PR training at some point in our lives, because I have said what you started with a number of times. If you don't tell your story, someone else is going to tell it for you. And especially when it comes down to crisis scenarios like the one that we were faced with as that pandemic was breaking and sort of it was it was a game of 52 card pickup, you know, and nobody knew what was going on and nobody, you know, it was day to day. Um, And what a great idea that you suggested about taking the picture uh, of the teacher at their kitchen table, you know, trying to teach their own kids while they're also trying to teach their own classrooms over Zoom. Um, you know, I experienced that firsthand. My wife is a teacher, so she was faced with the same mm-hmm. thing. Um, and and I think it's really easy to um, criticize at a distance or to get that keyboard courage that we we all might get at one point or another. And uh, you know, born of maybe a little bit of frustration too on behalf of our kids. You know, we want to see our kids you know, not have their lives upended by something that isn't their fault, so to speak. Um, Were there any specific things that you recommended to any of your clients um, along the lines maybe of that photo of how to communicate or what to communicate or maybe the frequency with which they should be communicating? Because at some point, I guess at one point, maybe you don't have enough to even say. And as you put it, you know, you can't keep saying we're working on it. But on the other hand, you can't overload people with, you know, like an email a day or, uh, you know, more information, you know, you know, and maybe whipsaw people. Well, now we're doing this and now we're doing that. Are there are there ways that you guided your clients through communicating with their their different stakeholder groups? Well, this is probably where I got really lucky, Jody, or maybe it's, uh, you know, a little bit of strategy on my part. But as an entrepreneur, I, I even have this post on my computer that I only take on projects that light me up. And so as I look at clients, I'm, I'm ensuring that these are clients that are ready for PR, that even if they don't understand it, that they're open um, and that they will trust me and we build that trust. So thankfully, and, I'll, and knock on wood, because I know we're still part of this pandemic, but we didn't have any issues with any of the clients. But that being said, they also had foundations of trust built with their families for many years because they had been frequently communicating, they had been open, they'd always been transparent. You know, one school in particular um, was in a very, uh, it, was a, it was an independent school. They had an excellent public school system around them that a lot of people said, well, why am I gonna pay money to send my child to an independent school when we've got this great public school system here? And, and just to know, my kids are in public school and I work with a lot of public schools, but um, in, in this case, they ended up getting a lot of families from the public school because the parents were feeling like, you know, we don't know what's going on. And when, when the board's not coming out with anything and the superintendent's not saying anything for a week or two weeks at a time, we don't hear from them. And all of a sudden we get a text message at 6 p.m. on Friday to check our emails. And to us, that signals that they don't want to be contacted because everybody's out of the office. We can't trust them with our child. And so I think we almost saw the reverse. So I saw what happened when bad communication was happening or poor communication or not thought out strategy. Um, When we had these clients in these other situations who were attracting students like, like, you know, flies to honey, or is that even a term? I'm not even sure, but they were just getting, getting these students because of the poor communication. And it was very interesting. The families would come and they'd say, we loved our teachers. We loved our principal. 
and and they were switching with public schools too so it wasn't just to to private schools but when they did not get the communication from their schools or their districts they were gone and we saw that in higher ed too right we saw a lot of switching around majors with students and parents going I'm not going back to school next semester if I don't know what's happening. I'm just going to stay here. I'm going to enroll in my community college, or I'm just going to take, now that I can just take classes online, why am I paying for the big fancy campus? I'm going to take classes over here. And I don't trust them because I haven't heard from them in, in three weeks or two weeks, which to your point, you know, it, it almost sounds like it's too frequent, but during the pandemic and the height of it, you know, if we weren't hearing from people, again, going back to the rumor mills were just circulating. So the opposite effect, thankfully, my clients were all, you know, knock on wood, they all did really well because they were all getting new students. And for public schools, that means extra state funding if they're, if they're in the U.S. For private schools, it's obviously more tuition. And in higher ed, that's more tuition. So um, it was very interesting to see the reverse of that. Yeah, and I definitely saw that with my higher ed clients as well. You know, the battle for uh, keeping the students uh, and, and doing exactly what you described, you know, may, maybe choosing to save a little money because, hey, I'm, if I'm going to take Zoom classes, I'll take Zoom classes. And I think going back to your point about the teacher, you know, working double duty, taking care of their own children and, and their Zoom children, so to speak, their Zoom classroom, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 um, misfounded, that's the, un, I guess, unfounded um, impression that somehow Zoom school is cheaper than in-person school uh, and sort of uh, convincing people that that's not the, especially in higher ed, convincing people that that's not the case. And in fact, it's quite the opposite that it co even costs more to conduct Zoom mm -hmm. classes. Did you have to do any of that battle sort of in the public sphere to let people know that, hey, this is, this is challenging? Um, I actually did it with my clients, but because of my coursework um, in my doctor of education program, I have a lot of classmates and friends um, that I still are in touch with who are superintendents or um, heads of business offices. And I have no problem helping friends, you know, advise them a little bit here and there. And I remember one coming and saying, oh my gosh, it's April. And she was a, a assistant superintendent of, of business operations for a pretty large school district. And she said, I'm looking at over between a million to three million dollar budget deficit because keeping in mind at the time that's q3 q4 for schools because they run an academic year budget july 1 to june 30th so when the pandemic hit and all of a sudden they have to go buy all these these chromebooks hot spots um and even try to find places that could partner with so that children in areas that couldn't get that could get access to the school that they were going to be running a million to $3 million, maybe more budget shortage because of that. And that, where did that come from? You're not getting new students, right? So that's going to be rolled into the next year. And I actually have um, one client right now with a busing shortage where the superintendent rented um, big Econoline vans with his own money and went around and picked up kids just to get them in school um, because it was a very inequitable district. So when we look at you know, not blatant communication, but you look at this, you know, storytelling behind the scene and not to exploit any of that for PR purposes, but that's all important stuff that families need to know. You know, I've been, I've been very heavily involved in a lot of the, the school funding um, conversations in, in my state for the last several years. And so I know a lot, I know what every school district of my state gets per student. I know what happens if a family of three pulls out I know how far in advance that this is happening partway through the year, how that's gonna affect the budget. So I'm pretty aware of that. And it's very easy to, um, sometimes when you have, thankfully not too many of mine, but sometimes you have people from other departments that you might not be working with and say, well, why do we need to do this? Or why do we need to do that? And I can very easily say, if we don't share this story and you have 10 families leave, that's X amount of dollars that's gonna be out of your district or X amount of dollars that's gonna be out of your private or independent school, X amount of tuition dollars out of your out of your higher ed. And I think sometimes you almost have to put it like that. And then you, you sometimes get compliance with, okay, let's, let's get that messaging out there. So let's segue then into earned media and talk about how much of that story you tell to reporters, how much you either proactively pitch those stories to reporters or how much you share when your phone rings and you're getting in questions from reporters? You know, what, what was the strategy that you used, whether it was higher ed or K through 12, assuming that they were either similar or different, you know, how much of that did you choose to share and how did you go about doing it? 
it's been tough. I mean, the last year and a half, um, it's been tough from the perspective of we've had some phenomenal stories to share of some great, great things happening. You know, the, the quote unquote Zoom classes, it wasn't that bad for everybody. There were a lot of kids that who flourished in it because either of anxiety issues or learning differences or bullying, or they just happened to, you know what? I like to actually be at home. I'm more, more of a homebody. I like this. I can work ahead. And so there were a lot of success stories. Unfortunately, there weren't a lot of media who wanted to pick up on those success stories. You know, we had some, some reporters in some areas that, that would want to run things, but a lot of it was more like, well, what are you doing about COVID protocols? And what are you doing about this? And how much is this costing the district? And it's very hard to almost not take offense at that, um, let alone like I'm not even in-house, you know, I'm a consultant. And I felt myself almost sometimes getting defensive, kind of being like, do you know how hard they're working? They're doing such a phenomenal job. So trying to keep a cool head when you feel like you're constantly being hammered, like whatever you're doing, it's lose, lose, right? So if, if you were to go out there and say, well, we have to spend $3 million on Chromebooks for our students. Sometimes instead of like the, the narrative being, wow, that's so great that our district did this and wow, the business office and finance managers spent like a whole month figuring out how to do this without taking money away from the classroom. Sometimes the narrative would turn around and go, well, what did they waste all that money for? They could have got a better deal. I don't know why they had to spend all that. Does that mean that technology in the classrooms were horrible to begin with that our kids didn't have that? And so it was just like this, it was like this very vicious, vicious cycle. And so really with, with you know, with my clients, we try to keep hammering home the good stories and kind of never give up. It was almost that old school, like PR, you know, tactics. Like I'm just going to keep going because I know I'm going to change the angle. I'm going to, I'm going to tweak it. Then let's focus on the teachers. Then let's focus on telling some of the alumni stories and let's help them promote. Even if it's just like a little tiny snippet where it might've gotten mentioned, you know, just like one little thing about something great that the principal did outside of work hours, but they were mentioned in a great article. We're going to take that as a win. And one of the big things I saw as a shift, Jody, over the last year, year and a half was creating our own content. So this is going back. And I know you and I have spoken before, like I'm an old school PR. I'm classically, if you quote unquote, classically trained PR. I've got my master's in strategic PR more than about 20 years ago now. So I've been doing it for a long time. And back, you know, 20, 25 years ago, when I first started in the industry, you fax the press release over and you're taught to write the press release as if it's a story because the goal was like if you could get the publication or reporter to take what you wrote almost word for word in the article, that was kind of the goal. And that sort of went away a little bit in the digital world with emails, that sort of thing. Now they say, okay, you keep pitches short, you know, two to three sentences. And so we just started creating more of our own content. And it was telling our story. And it was, you know, if this particular client can't get picked up, then you know what? We're going to tell the great success stories of an alum who went through this program, of a teacher who made an impact, of a parent who, you know, was so grateful for the support that her child received. And we're going to tell that. And, and higher ed clients, we're going to talk about, you know, the mom who was a working mom while trying to balance school and kids at home and work, work from home, and how her professors helped her, you know, uh, were flexible and then they were helped her make, make it through it with support and being, you know, aware of her situation and being empathetic. And so as we started to tre create that content, we were able to get pitches out of it. We were able to get social media posts out of it. We were able to get blog posts out of it. We were able to get newsletter posts out of it. We were able to get admissions materials out of it. So then when a potential student came to look at the school or a potential family came to look at the school and they had you know, I'm concerned because I'm in X, Y, and Z, and that might take up too much time, or I'm concerned because I'm from this city, and, and I don't know if I fit in here. We had all that content, and the admissions people will love it because they say, hey, hold on, I'm going to send you a link to um, actually a success story of somebody who came from your area or somebody who has your background. And so we found that it's actually been hugely successful because then now it's been able to help us propel those good story pitches by linking to that, by, oh, by example, you know, by the way, I actually have these three people who could join in on the pitch with you. And so that's been a, a big bonus. So it's been, it's been tough. It's been fun though, because you have to, it's like, like I said, it goes back to my old school PR route where you're really looking at what's the strategy, like, how can I, how can I really get noticed? And although it takes a lot more time than it, than it used to, at the same time, when it does hit, um, it really pays off and it pays off well. So agreed. So agreed. And I think if, if, uh, if you haven't figured out how to use that, that TV studio that you have in your pocket, it's called a phone. 
uh, to do all the things yeah. that you just described. And I've been, I've been harping on this for the last more than two years. Um, you know, know how to use video, know how to cut video, know how to send that video to all the different people that you want, whether it's your earned media, your own media, um, wherever it's going. Um, we have so many terrific tools at our disposal now that I think if we're not using them and not using them effectively, we're, we're missing out, we're not doing our job and we're not serving our clients well. Um, let's pivot Absolutely. a little bit. Let's pivot a little bit to what's going on right now in terms of communication. We see a lot of, um, and I don't want to get political here, but we, we see a lot of, let's call it acrimony at board of education meetings and a lot of divide over things like masks and vaccines and et cetera, et cetera. And I'm wondering if we can talk a little bit about how you're advising any of your clients who might be caught in these positions where um, you've got two very vocal groups on either side of an issue. Um, how do you help them navigate uh, what could be a, a very dangerous minefield uh, in serving the students? Well, you know, I think the beauty of working in education and what people outside education forget, and then even what people inside of education um, forget about themselves, they're pretty smart. You know, they understand the, the rules and the regulations and how to conduct themselves. And, and a lot of them, especially when you're talking about educators, they're used to having 20 to 30 kids in a classroom. And I'm not trying to equate the way that adults are behaving to kids, because I do think it's much worse in many cases. I actually um, think the kids however, are more mature, but that's just me. I, I absolutely, I, I agree. I agree. If you could, if you could hear some of the things that I hear from some of my school PR friends, um, even some of the stuff that I've been targeted at with, with clients at public board meetings, it's, it's just enough to make your skin crawl and you wonder, it, you don't have to wonder, I should say, about why people are leaving education. But, um, you know, they've done a really good job, a lot of these school districts and trying to manage um, how they conduct their board meetings, you know, a lot of it is political. I mean, if they have board regulations and rules, they've got to follow it. So if they, if they've had it already written the board rules that they've got to have X number of time, have, have to have X amount of time for public speakers to come, they've got to figure out how to work that in because they can't just go change the rules just because they don't want to, because the worst thing is, is to go and hold secret meetings because you don't want anybody there. The once people find out you're holding secret meetings, which thankfully none of my, my clients have done, but I have seen done in the past, um, early on in my career, it, that's just no good, right? There goes that trust and, and transparency. So they're actually very good at keeping a level head, keeping calm. And, and one of the things that I've actually heard from superintendents and heads of school is that they tell me that they remind themselves. And I think this is a really great piece of piece of advice that it's for the kids. It's for the kids. It's, we just need to get through this. It's for the kids. Um, they give their people that, that have time to speak two to three minutes. I've seen some schools where they have changed the board rules to where you have to sign up in advance to come speak at board meetings. But, I mean, it varies from every single school district, um, you know, state to state, city to city, country to country, and how they're doing it. So I think one of the, the components is, is if they can just not get heated um, and just in the back of their mind to say, you know what, these per people are just, they just want to hear themselves speak. They want to get it out. Um, they need somebody to complain to. I, I think that educators have done a great job of being very empathetic towards parents and community members. But you know what? They're going through it, too. So I think they're kind of get a little bit tired now. And I think this is where we start to might see some um, some school board members in some areas, as, as we're starting to see a little bit, fight back because uh, they're, they're just tired of being dumped on. Yeah, as, as has been uh, pointed out at, at my local school board. Uh, let's all remember that whether you agree or disagree with what the schools are doing, uh, the people who are sitting there on the board are volunteering their time. They are, they are not there getting paid. They're not cashing a paycheck. Um, they're doing the best thing that they can do for, for the kids, and they're there volunteering their time. And so the least you can do is be respectful, whether you agree or disagree with what they're doing, be respectful um, of the job that they're trying to do and recognize, as you said, that... Um, we all want to do this for the kids. We all want to do the best thing we can for the kids. Um, and, and, and everybody's rowing in that direction. Uh, again, whether you agree or disagree, um, I think respect yeah, is, I the, think, is the point of the day. And Jordan, you nailed it on the head, right? I mean, that's, that's what we have to remember. And part of that is also storytelling. You know, people want to know who are on the board. Um, you know, maybe they didn't vote them in. Maybe they had no idea how they got voted in. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a private school board. They don't know. 
So part of that is almost humanizing it with stories again, right? And it's not just these, what what we would say is some uh, around political season, whenever whenever it was election time, just inundated with calls about, you know, the candidates wanting to come to the school all of a sudden and read to the kids. It's not like that. It is talking about these school board members, like the things that they have accomplished, the things that they are doing in the community. We see that in higher ed. They do a great job of promoting their, their board of regents or, you know, who it is because they want everybody to know, like, look at our phenomenal board. Um, I don't think we do that enough in, in K through 12. And I think it's something that can be done and it can be done very easily. You know, meet, meet our board member, you know, Mr. Mr. Smith was, a, I actually saw this at my hometown one. Mr. Smith has been a police officer in our town for 20 years, and he's absolutely committed to our youth. And, you know, and it was a nice little story about Mr. Smith on a local school board. Um, and so I think that just little snippets like that can go a long way. Is it traditional PR? No. But hey, you know what? It's all part of communication. Well, and that's a great segue into the last question that I wanted to, to touch on here in our conversation, which is where is all this going? You know, we're, we're sort of at the halfway point, if you will, of the school year, right? Um, where, or at least we'll, we'll be there in a, in a month or so. Um, what is the second half of the school year, the, the, the 2022, you know, uh, January to June part of the school year look like? And how do we as communicators help to continue to tell those stories? You know, I think a lot of school communicators have done a phenomenal job of social media posts, um, you know, sharing it that way. Uh, I'm an old school fan of we don't own social media platforms, as we saw when Facebook and Instagram went down. So I've been pushing clients to showcase the news on their actual websites, on the homepage, uh, in their e-newsletters, you know, work with the local media. See if you can, like, I, we have one client right now that does a phenomenal job with um, their virtual school, little snippets, their videos. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, these are so perfect. This is perfect for Pinterest. This is perfect for, you know, showcase like what you do for the students. So it's not just the regular news that you get. So it's showcasing more of what we've got. I mean, I think the beauty, going back to what you're saying with the, the phone in the pocket, the beauty of the virtual learning is that we've got a lot of content now, whether, you know, whether we think we do or not. And starting to kind of go through those archives and take a look at it. like who was there a teacher that did a really great job using say like a smart board or using like my daughter's one kindergarten teacher she was so creative i was i always wanted to hire her because she was putting together these little videos every week for the kids to kind of kick off the weekend and i'm thinking that could be repurposed to show how wonderful the school is what a family this this school is you know how they really do care about the kids because of course you know, like you want to think your your school teachers care about the, the children, but how do you show that and how do you tell that, whether it's at the local media level or the national media level? Well, there are a lot of teachers doing some innovative things. There are a lot of teachers that are influencers that have tens of thousands of followers on Instagram. There are some that have hundreds of thousands of followers on TikTok. How are we not leveraging them in the media? You know, I, I think I think we've gotten the mindset a lot of times in PR that can the PR professional. So I know what what uh, what is news and what's not. However, I mean, you cannot ignore the fact that some of these teachers and principals are really, 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 really good at social media. They're sought after speakers. And I think that they can contribute a lot at the national level um, and the local level. But I think we're kind of missing the boat a little bit with education experts. Um, we're asking people that are maybe not in schools to be on the, these uh, national broadcasts and be quoted in the national media. What about the people that are actually in schools and that are doing it really well and they're speaking and they're running PD and they're, they've got these videos? They're the ones that we should be out there kind of sharing their story. So again, just looking at those news angles, I do think that I'm hoping that the news is turning the tide. Um, it all just takes like another wave of COVID, I think, to knock, knock kids back home um, to, go remote, to go to remote learning. But I mean, we've had great success with our agency. I mean, we've, we've placed in Parents Latina, Good Housekeeping, NBC News, just in the last several months with great stories of things that teachers, and, and they're not unusual things. These are great teachers, but these aren't out of the norm. So I think that certain media outlets are hungry for good news. And however that good news looks, I mean, this NBC News piece was about like a hybrid, a hybrid learning environment, right? So that's something that two years ago, we wouldn't have really thought about some kids being in the classroom and some kids being at home. So that's a great angle. You know, the good housekeeping piece was they want to honor teachers. And I just happen to have a lot of school clients. So it's like, here's six for you to choose from, you know, and so 
I think that people are looking for the good news, but I think as PR um, practitioners, we also have to be very strategic in how we're telling it and not just throwing everything out there saying like, oh, this is good news, this is good news, this is good news, this is good news. Really thinking about what is it that people want to know about our school? What is it that we want to do to help build our brand? And who is it that we can put out there as expert? And let me get my list of 10 people so I can have in my back pocket. Makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Well, Amanda, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge here. We are going to segue into the rapid fire question portion of our podcast now. This is where we steal a page from inside the actor's studio and ask our guests a series of rapid fire questions. I think you're familiar with this if you've heard our podcast before. So let's take a look at these questions and give you rapid fire question. Number one, Amanda, what is your favorite news source? Um, personally, I read Wall Street Journal every day. And then professionally, I actually read, um, it's called The Educator out of Australia because I'm kind of fascinated with what they're doing on the other side of the world in education. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. All right. Rapid fire question number two, your favorite social media platform. Twitter. I love Twitter. I know I've said again, I probably sound so old. Like I love my Twitter. I've gotten so many great opportunities through Twitter professionally. I mean, we met on Twitter. I've got a couple my a couple of my employees from Twitter. I absolutely love it. I've actually deleted other social media apps right from my phone to kind of cut down on time spent on the phone except for Twitter. So it is the modern AP news feed for sure. For anyone who's ever yeah. been in a newsroom, <laughs> it's that's that's what it is. All right, rapid fire question number three: coffee or alcohol? Well, I okay, so the, I have an interesting answer to this. I am like a hot chocolate addict. Like I'm talking even in July, I will have a hot chocolate a day. So during the day, that's I have to say it's hot chocolate, but I do enjoy craft beer with my husband on date night. We are in Michigan, which is a, is a great ca uh, craft beer capital of the country. Very good. Very good. All right. We'll have to, tr well, we're in the season for hot chocolate, uh, even though you drink it all year <laughs> round. So I think when we're done here taping here, maybe I'll go grab myself a hot chocolate too. There you go. <laughs> Rapid fire question number four, what is your favorite on the run food? Um, I love smoothies. I'm a big fan of smoothie throw it through. I feel like I'm eating healthy. So I always go, we have a Beyond Juicery that just opened up in town and they have a total energy plus. So it has my kale and my spinach and, and my fruits. And I feel like I'm being super healthy. Not sure if I am, but it makes me feel like it. Well, you put that with the hot chocolate and you're good, I guess. <laughs> I know, it balances out all the sugar I'm getting from my hot chocolate. There you go. All right, and rapid fire question number five. What do you want to be after you finish this career? I'm never going to retire. I don't think so. You know, my, my husband always says to me, he goes, you're still going to be working when you're in your 80s, aren't you? And I said, hopefully. I think the beauty of PR, and, and, and I love this as, as a question, because I went into PR, um, I started almost 20, I think 25 years ago was my first job in PR. And I remember somebody saying to me, and this is, you figure 25 years ago, this is before social media, before really the internet, you know, before remote working. And I remember somebody saying, you know, the beauty of PR is that it's something you can do anywhere. You can write anywhere. You can pick up a phone from anywhere. Um, and I was such a big fan of traveling and knew I wanted to have a family one day that, that PR was always something that I wanted to do. And I just believe that I'm going to never be able to sit still and stop working. Although, as I, as I tell my husband, I said, don't worry, once I get into those retirement years, I said my price will go, the retainer will go up really, really high. So I might only be working six days, six days a, a year but I'll be doing something. That sounds great. I, I have the same, the same philosophy. Well, Amanda, this has been a great conversation again. Thanks so much for joining us. Please let, let people know how they can find you online. Sure. So the website is holdsworthcommunications.com, just like it sounds. Um, let's meet up on Twitter. It's holdsworthcom, so H-O-L-D-S-W-O-R-T-H-C-O-M-M. And you can find me on LinkedIn under Dr. Amanda Holdsworth. Excellent. Well, you are the second doctor we have had on the PR podcast. We should actually get more doctors on the PR podcast because this <laughs> has been really enlightening for me. So thank you. Oh, well, thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it. All right. And thank you everyone for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the show and connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the PR podcast and send us a question or a comment. Our intro is by Christopher Apple. You can find him and his fantastic photography on Instagram at Christopher underscore A-P-P-O-L-D-T. 
check him out there and hire him for all your photography needs. You can find me online at Jody Fisher on all the socials and on the web at JodyFisherPR.com. We'll see you next time on the PR Podcast.